All right. Welcome, everyone. This is our second Climate Careers Chat of the Year. And first up for everybody, we have a poll, which all of the information, by the way, is on Slia's Instagram. That's Sustainable Leaders in Action. We have all of the answers right there on the Instagram, but we want to know if you looked at the posts or not. So go ahead and fill out this poll with everything that you know about coral, deep sea, California marine life, all that. We got it all here. All right, we'll give you guys a second to take a look at that. All right, I think that's been enough time. All right, so the answers to this lovely poll, I'm gonna call up Evan, my co-moderator here to help me read these off. So the first, okay, okay, we've got our answers. We've got our answers from the audience. What color is coral tissue? 73% of you, but clear. And if I'm not mistaken, that is the correct answer, Natasha? I believe. That one was you. That one was, that one was right, clear. Yes. Uh, all right, woo, we have a very smart audience. All right, number two, what is the deepest estimated depth that recreational divers can reach? Now, 64% of you said 150 feet. And what is it? Evan, would you like to read it off? Sure, if tech support wants to show the answer. 130 feet. That's like 13 stories deep. Imagine diving that deep. 130 it's really interesting. feet. No. Right. Crazy. All right. Want to go to our next question? I believe it is. California has 120 marine protected areas in its coastal waters. Um, my sources in the back tell me that that is indeed false. And the correct answer is that California has 124 marine protected areas in its coastal waters. So there you go. Rachel, I'll let you do the next one. Yes. All right. The fourth and final question. A marine heat wave is a period of abnormally high temperatures in a sea or ocean. Now, is this true or false? This is true. And a lot of you guys said true. Very nice. Very good. Yes, a marine heat wave is a period of normally high temperatures in a sea or ocean, which makes sense, it's a heat wave. All right, let's go on to our next slide. Good job on the poll, everybody. All right, Evan, I'll let you introduce this climate careers chat since it's your very last one. Thanks, Rachel. Okay, <clears throat> so just a quick, um, a brief overview of our agenda for today's climate careers chat. We will introduce ourselves first, and then we will start out with Shell Matsuda's presentation followed by a quick informational break um, where the audience can stretch their legs and grab a snack or whatever they deem necessary. And then we will hear the presentation from Natasha Benjamin. And finally, we will finish this off with our popular Q&A session and some final closing statements. Amazing, it's gonna be a ton of fun. So hello everyone and welcome to our second Climate Careers Chat of 2022 hosted by all of the people you see on the board right now. We have Sustainable Leaders in Action, 
SCOCO, aka Sustainable Contra Costa. And we have some people from both of these lovely places, including, guess what, the library as well. And these people simply must introduce themselves. So I'm going to hand it over to our lovely Climate Careers Chat intern, Mia, to introduce herself. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, everyone. My name is Mia Jang, and I'm the Climate Career Chat Intern for Sustainable Leaders in Action. Um, I'm a current junior at Camp Lindo High School, and I'm so excited to have you all here with us. Um, I'll let Ellie introduce herself next. Thank you, Mia. Hello. Uh, my name is Eliana Vertrez. I work at Sustainable Contra Costa. Um, we are a community of educators and community members um, and individuals and organizations who really care about sustainability. Um, and we are committed to making an ecologically just, sustainable and clean future for all. Um, we're very fortunate to work with um, our youth team, Sustainable Leaders in Action and the Contra Costa County Library on this program. Um, so I will hand it off to Jacqueline. My name is Jacqueline Higgins. I am the Antioch Librarian for Adult and Teen Services. We have been doing these programs with SLEA and we could not be happier with the results. Uh, this group gives hope for the future. It really, really does. The um, next upcoming uh, program like this will be in, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, August, I believe. We have another one coming up in August. And then yes, again at the end of the year. And pardon? Oh, I was just saying that, yes, we do. One in August and one in December, if I'm not mistaken. November. And November. This, this is really great. Um, Contra Costa County Library has actually been focusing on sustainability this year, uh, for this fiscal year. And in doing so, we have gotten so many wonderful responses from the community. We're so happy to be doing this. The slide that you see here is just a teeny example of what we have in our library of things that you can reach on our website. So you can take check out an energy efficient toolkit. You can check out an outdoor explorer backpack that comes with a parking pass. I'm sure you've all heard about the California state uh, park passes that we're giving out. And the seed library is really fun. So if you need anything, if you have any questions, just let us know. In the meantime, take it away, Slea. Um, Albert, you can introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Albert Garcia and I'm a librarian also with Contra Costa County Library. And I'm here mainly to support this group. And uh, I find that's very minimal work because they're a very, very um, efficient group and they're able to take care of their own thing. So it's, uh, I'm just here to support and happy to be here. Well, thank you very much, everyone. I'm Rachel Kimball. I work with SLEA, Sustainable Leaders in Action, and I'm one of your co-moderators this evening. I'm currently a sophomore at Crondelet High School. And one thing you should know about me is I absolutely love baking, but that is not what you came here to see. So let's move on and introduce our other co-moderator, Evan. Hello everybody, my name is Evan Lee. I'm currently a senior at Northgate High School and I intend on pursuing environmental studies in college next year at UC Santa Barbara. I've been a member of SLEA for around a year and I actually joined SLEA because of a climate careers chat meeting just like this one. So, you know, me moderating, it's really like coming out full circle. I have been doing beach cleanups with my family for as long as I can remember. And in my free time, I love to play tennis and also to cook. But the reason why you guys are here is to see your awesome panelists and our amazing panelists Sheo Matsuda and Natasha Benjamin uh, have joined us for this event and we are extremely excited for you to hear all about them. First, we're gonna play a little game of two truths and a lie to get to know our first panelist, Sheo Matsuda, a coral biologist at Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. So Shale, if you wanna go over your two truths and a lie, that'd be great. All right, um, so I used to take a boat to work is number one. There's a sea slug named after me is number two. And I share an office with 32,000 animals.
all right participants and if you want to let us know in the chat ooh. Awesome. We have a little over half of our attendees who have answered. All right, Shale, if you want to go ahead and tell everyone, I can launch the results. Um, All right. right after. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so the two truths are I used to take a boat to work and I share an office with 32,000 animals. Very tricky. <laughs> All right, so a little over half of you got that right. Awesome. Um, Slea, we are going to stop screen sharing now and Shale, please take it away. All right. My name is Shale Matsuda. Thanks so much for having me. So, I did my master's degree at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. And underneath the museum are two basement levels where we do our research. And I studied sea slugs there, um, which are a group of brightly colored animals. The specific ones I study are called nudibranchs. And what's so cool about nudibranchs is that they steal their, their prey's defense mechanisms and put them in their own tissues and use them to defend themselves. So they can do this by eating things like corals or anemones and taking the stinging cells and putting them in their tissues. But they could also do it with chemical toxins and chemical compounds. And what's really cool about those chemical compounds is that sometimes when the slugs are putting them into their own tissues, they'll modify them, creating something brand new. And I was sitting down in my uh, advisor's basement and going through some papers, looking at uh, different studies that had been done. And I came across this one study and my mind was blown. I, I picked up the phone and I called my mom and I was like, mom, you're never gonna believe this, but there's a sea slug whose chemical compounds are exhibiting anti-cancer properties against the same form of cancer that I survived as a child. And the ocean is full of surprises. And that's just one of the reasons why I love doing what I do. So with the two truths and a lie, um, there's no sea slug named after me. However, during that degree, I did describe a new species of sea slug, Dory prismatica rossi, which I named after my brother. So the most important thing that I'll say in this whole talk is that being happy and being your full self is the most important thing that you can strive for in a career in any field. And for me, um, part of what I think about when I'm being my full self is my friends and family, my communities, both research and my social communities, my mentors and mentees, and basically looking for a place that I feel safe around people who support me where I can thrive. And so today I'm at the Shedd Aquarium where I'm in conservation research and I work on corals. And this is my team, Team Coral down here. I work with Bryce Corbett and Dr. Ross Cunning. So what does a research biologist do? Um, day in and day out, uh, my, my job is driven by asking questions about the world around me. Um, to answer these questions, we run experiments. Sometimes those are in the field, in the ocean, and sometimes we bring corals into the lab to run controlled things. Um, I work with a lot of 3D modeling to answer my questions. I do a lot of lab work uh, to look at DNA sequencing. More often than not, I'm sitting in front of my computer doing statistics. I use a lot of coding or writing papers. That's kind of the currency of our field. So anytime we do a study and we find results, we write them up in, in a paper that then other researchers can read and then ask new questions and build more, um, more, more knowledge. 
another part of my job um, that really excites me is that I do a lot of education, a lot of science communication work. I love meeting new people. I do a lot of equity and justice and STEM work. And probably some of the most exciting things that I do are constructing my own experiments. Like we have to build all of our own like tank systems. So I learn a lot about plumbing and construction and also uh, working with electronics like Arduinos to create sensors to answer a lot of the questions that we do. So what does this all look like? Um, here's just a snapshot into a little bit of a day in the life. So I study corals and coral bleaching, which is predominantly caused by ocean warming from climate change. And if you see that one picture of that zoomed in picture of a coral polyp with that yellow background, all those little dots inside the coral are tiny algal symbionts. And those are the things that kicked out, get kicked out of the coral when the ocean gets too warm. And then you can see the corals clear tissue underneath. And so what a lot of my work is really looking at is, you know, what is causing this to happen? How can we help these corals be more resilient and survive into the future? I work very often inside an, un, an outside uh, laboratory. You can see me scuba diving with some corals on these tables that we're doing experiments with. We do a lot of coral uh, reproduction, coral spawning. So a photo of us at night looking into the water, all that stuff on the surface are coral uh, gametes. Also, sometimes it's not quite as fun as other times. And that picture on the bottom right is a photo of me at 3 a.m. when I was doing an experiment that ran super late. And since we do take a boat to work there in Hawaii, um, I got stuck on the island overnight. But my whole science career is not just doing experiments, like I said. So a lot of what I do also is work with young people to create virtual reality experiences. I do a lot of art and science. I love to give presentations, to host conferences, and to, yeah, just be a part of all the communities I am and then bring science into those spaces. And, and with a career in research, you can work at many different places. You can work for the government, you can work at a university or a college, you can work for nonprofits, you can work for the industry. But for me, I really like working at aquariums and museums because they allow me to do research, but they also give me access to an international audience who's, you know, who are interested in sustainability and conservation to engage with, you know, some of the most pressing conservation challenges of our time. So how did I end up here? Um, there are many ways to study corals, to um, do research, and I'm going to spend sort of the, the rest of the talk telling you a little bit about my journey and some things I learned uh, along the way. So I grew up right outside of Chicago where that star is on the globe. And surprise, surprise, there are no coral reefs here. So a question that I get asked very often is like, you grew up in the Midwest, like how did you get interested in coral reefs? Um, when I was a kid, the only connection I had to the ocean was actually at the Shedd Aquarium. And so I credit that place with really sort of sparking that wonder in me when I was younger. Um, I was not someone who knew that they wanted to be a marine biologist forever. Um, science classes were always sort of my escape in high school. It was, I just really loved the scientific method. Um, I loved asking questions and I was really drawn to the environment, to being outside. And so I knew sort of from an early age that I wanted to pursue a career in the environment somehow. And I really wasn't sure, you know, which path that would lead me down. So right after I finished high school, I moved to Santa Cruz, California. I went to the University of California at Santa Cruz uh, for my bachelor's degree. And there I had a double major in environmental studies and feminist studies. So no, no marine biology quite yet. Uh, my focus was in sustainable agriculture and water policy. And I was really interested in how, um, yeah, how we can create like a more sustainable, equitable uh, food system. And interestingly, I had never heard of feminist studies before, but I ended up taking some classes and I found out much later that that degree is so incredibly helpful for the work that I do now, because you can't really work towards environmental solutions out of the context of understanding the people that are impacted by them. And so having an education that focused on like power and economy, agency, uh, misogyny, racism, 
was really helpful in understanding, you know, how are we framing some of these issues in the greater context? Um, during this time, I also spent a lot of it figuring out who I am and what made me happy. So I played team sports, I played in a band, um, I volunteered at Natural Bridges State Park. And it was through that last experience where I was, you know, communicating science to the public for the first time. Uh, it was all thanks to one of the most important mentors that I had, uh, Professor Jenny Anderson. And she was really the first person who showed me the power of communicating science and uh, getting folks in your community interested in, you know, becoming stewards of the environment around them. This next slide is probably the most important one. So I took a whole lot of time sort of away from science. Um, for the next six or seven years, I went out down a completely different career path. I first worked at the Santa Cruz Teen Center as a program coordinator. So I was developing uh, different types of programs for the youth in our community. From there, I started working in outdoor education as a high ropes facilitator. Um, I went back to grad school. So I started to pursue a degree, a master's degree at San Francisco State in women's studies. And there are a lot of ways to get an education. Um, however, you know, Academia is something that really works for some people and it definitely doesn't work for other people. I'm one of those people who it really does work for and I really love being in school. So it was really hard for me when after a semester, I found that I really wasn't getting the type of education that I had thought I was going to get going into it and I had to make the difficult decision to, uh, to withdraw. Um, I threw a picture of a coffee cup on there because I also at the same time was working in cafes to supplement my income and to allow me to do other things that were really important to me at the time, like art and music. However, about that time, I was starting to feel um, like I was ready for something new. And I quit my jobs, sold all my stuff, and I traveled around the world for a year. And during that time, I finally learned how to scuba dive. And I'm pretty scared of water, uh, so I had been very hesitant to do this before, but the first time that I descended under the water, it was like a whole new magical world had opened up. And I was curious about like, what were these organisms that I was seeing? What are these animals? But at the same time, I was noticing that there was a lot of, uh, you know, trash underwater. Um, and just, it really kind of just sparked something in me that, you know, I, I knew that I had to stop talking about being too old to go back to school at that point and just make this happen. Now, at this point, I was already in my later 20s. And so I wanted to be sure that, you know, this career change was, was what I really wanted to do. Like, could I live this life? And so I was in these little internet cafes, like searching for some volunteer programs to kind of get my feet wet, so to say, um, to see if, you know, marine biology was really what I thought it was. So I worked, partnered with a group called Global Visions, um, moved to the Yucatan in Mexico for the summer. And there I got my uh, dive master scuba diving license and participated in coral transect surveys. And so we were looking at are the protected areas in Mexico, are those coral reefs thriving um, compared to re areas that weren't protected? And so all the data we were collecting went towards um, understanding that better. And after that experience, I was, I was sold. And so I went back to San Francisco. I started volunteer diving at the Aquarium of the Bay just to practice diving more and to be around marine biologists. I started taking classes at City College uh, because there was a lot that I found that I had gaps in my undergrad that I needed to, before I could go back to grad school. Um, and, you know, there's these small moments that are huge turning points in our lives. And one of those for me was I was at this event at the Aquarium of the Bay and there was another volunteer there. And we were talking and I mentioned to her, I was like, hey, you know, I'm really interested in corals. I've always wanted to work on corals at the, you know, California Academy of Sciences. And she was like, oh, I know someone there. Like, I'll introduce you. And I didn't really expect anything, but I woke up the next day and there was an email in my inbox connecting me to the researcher there. One thing led to another. I went in for what I thought was an interview. And when I walked in the door, he was like, well, what do you want to work on first? And that one moment, you know, just like somebody who happened to know somebody who happened to know somebody, um, I was able to start to pursue my passions. And during this time, I was also tending bar um, because for, in order for me to be able to take classes and volunteer uh, to get the experience I needed for grad school, I had to find a job that would pay me a lot of money 
but not requiring me to work a lot of hours. And so working in the service industry was actually really critical for me to be able to get the experience that I needed. From there, I did a master's degree. And the reason I did a master's degree, even though I knew I wanted a PhD, um, was because I wanted to be more competitive so I could go into the labs that I wanted to go into for my PhD. So to get my first research experience, I decided to stay at the California Academy of Sciences, you know, where I worked on nudibranchs. Um, and another reason that staying in the area that I was from was really helpful because it allowed me to sort of build on the communities that I'd already been growing. So during this time, you know, I was able to give public talks. I created a science event series where I brought uh, you know, scientists into the communities that I was already a part of to do science sort of like unplugged and get people more engaged with science in their daily lives. Uh, and I was also able to mentor a lot of young people. So one of the coolest things about doing my degree at the California Academy of Sciences was working with their careers in science high school internship program, where I got to create um, science research experiences or art experiences to do with the youth in that program. And so, you know, having that sort of well-rounded life there was really critical for my happiness during that time. From there, I defended my thesis and two weeks later, I moved to Hawaii for my PhD at the University of Hawaii Manoa and the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. So what this picture is showing you is a, it's a, from a drone and that's one of our little boats right there from right off the research island. And on that little area of the reef that is like a little sand patch are our research tables. Um, when I was looking for an advisor, I was looking for a lab that was really big, so I'd have lots of people to bounce ideas off of. And it was really important for me to find someone who would you know, not only allow me to be my full self in the lab, but that really um, valued creative thinking, collaboration, science communication, and not someone that just said, oh, it's okay that if you do that, but I wanted somebody who also did those things in their life. And so working with Dr. Ruth Gates at the start of my PhD was, sort of a dream come true for me. And I went to Hawaii also in part because after being in San Francisco, we could travel for a few weeks to do research, but I wanted to be somewhere where like the ocean was in my backyard and coral reefs were surrounding us. And so because of that sacrificing, you know, moving away from my friends and family, instead what I was able to get was a research experience where you could come up with an idea and then jump in the ocean the next day and start to figure it out. And those are all sort of things, you know, that you'll want to be thinking about as you're trying to decide, like, you know, where do, where do you want to go? Where can you be happy? Where are those communities? Um, because grad school can be super rewarding, but also it's really hard and there is a lot of sacrifice. So really sort of making sure you have those communities is, is really critical. So after that, um, I got a postdoc at the Shedd Aquarium and, you know, Having grown up in Chicago, having gone to the shed as a, as a kid, this was really awesome. Um, a few years ago, I was lucky enough to come from Hawaii and actually join shed researchers on a research cruise in the Bahamas. And that was sort of, for me, you know, having that experience where I met new people and saw what they were doing in a different part of the world was when I really was like, this is where I want to go. Like, I really think I could thrive in this, in, on this team. And I love this photograph of this article they wrote about us because, you know, those are the lead researchers that are in the center diving, but then I noticed that they're in this yellow circle on the side. Um, that's me. And so I was hoping, you know, that, that could be a foreshadowing for where I am now and, and it is. And so sort of some parting words to have you all think about as you think about what to do with your future. Um, again, happiness and being your full self is like number one explore your interests, you know, try different things. I didn't know that necessarily that corals were the thing that was gonna grab me both, you know, for this, for biologically being so interesting, but also for caring about coral reefs and climate change issues. Office hours are so important and I didn't learn that until later. So if college is the path for you, take advantage of the free time that your professors will answer your questions and also help you build those relationships. I found for me that so much of me discovering the things that I really loved were because of the mentors that I had all along the way. And with that, you know, finding your communities. A lot of my community was not in science. They were not scientists. They were in different departments. They were in different parts of the community, but like really finding the people who see you and who can support you. Um, 
public service announcement that you can get funding to do graduate school. Um, there are lots of opportunities out there, whether they're grants um, or scholarships or also programs that are fully funded. So especially those of you who are on social media, um, once you're going down that path, there's a lot of uh, summer programs for college students that will pay you a stipend to get research experience and uh, to help you afford graduate school if you decide that's the path for you. Um, and also that you can always change careers, like school's not going anywhere. If you have time and interest to follow your passions, whether that's to try different careers, to learn different skill sets, to travel, you can always, uh, you can always change and you pivot and try something new. And to also remember that, you know, everyone's journey is different. And so, you know, for me, taking the, all that time off where at first I was really nervous that, you know, I hadn't gone straight into graduate school and what did I miss out on? But I actually found that a lot of those experiences were really the things that helped me be, you know, the, the researcher that I am today. And um, with that, I'm happy to answer questions at the very end. Thank you so much. Wow, that was amazing, Shale. Thank you so much for that. Now we will be taking a little quick break and give you all an opportunity opportunity to hear about Slia and Skoko's very own Cleaner Contra Cost Challenge. Uh, first, you're gonna hear a little bit about the Slia program from one of our lovely Slia members. Okay, I think that's me. Hi guys, I'm Kyle. I'm the graphic design intern at Sustainable Leaders in Action. Um, an honor to work with these guys. Um, so as we said before at the beginning, uh, we're this youth team based in Contra Costa. We come from all the different schools around the area. Um, and we meet online to make projects and sometimes do in-person projects too. So if you're interested and you like what we do, um, be sure to email alexiasustainablecoco.org down there. And we'll have all the information at the end of the slides. Um, so what if you're a volunteer, you could be doing stuff like this, climate career chats. You help find the panelists, you help make the slides, you help do the social media, you could be making newsletters. We do recipes, we talk about actions of the month, we talk about climate problems and sustainable solutions. Uh, we also have those actions of the month, we get together every month and we each try to do a um, sustainable activity. And then we have more, we have clean teams, we have graphic design, um, you could edit video, so much more. Um, as long as you have some kind of interest in sustainability, we have something for you. So we encourage you guys to check it out. It's a uh, high, mainly high schoolers and college students. Thank you, Kyle. That sounds amazing. Our youth team is really great. <laughs> um, so like I mentioned before, I work at Sustainable Contra Costa. Um, if you'll forgive me, I tripped over my words a little bit earlier, but Sustainable Contra Costa is a community of citizens, educators, innovators, and organizations working together for ecologically sustainable, economically vibrant, and socially just communities for all. And one of the ways that we do this is with the Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge. So if you have your phone and are interested in seeing what this is, please go ahead and scan the QR code on the left. Um, the Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge is a free online resource where you'll find practical solutions and local resources to help you save money, energy, water, and waste in your household. Um, you can see how each action improves your household's carbon footprint and track your progress to make an impact on climate change. So as you can see here, so far we've saved almost $300,000. We are, have almost met our goal of having 3,500 participating households by this summer. Um, we've saved 745 tons of CO2 and we have a lot of different um, we have a lot of different actions, um, like Kyle mentioned before, that um, will help you see your own carbon footprint, but also see this page change, which is really cool. Um, next slide, please. So the way you can do this is by looking at our actions page on the Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge. So first, all of these actions are put into different categories. Um, this is an example of the eat green and waste less category. So these are individual actions that you can take to lessen your carbon footprint. Um, but the really cool thing about is about each action is that it gives you um, a step-by-step -step resource guide on um, local resources for you as um, the person living in the household, but also steps on how to get started if you're not too sure. 
Um, so that's one of the really cool parts of the challenge. Um, next slide, please. Another cool part of the challenge is that you can take action and learn and earn and earn prizes. Um, so those include a free yard of mulch for every action you do, or not every action, for the first action that you complete. Um, and then from there, you can be entered in drawings on different just gift cards um, in different parts of Contra Costa County, wherever it's closest to you. Um, and if you are interested in learning more about this or about the Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge, you can go to sustainablecoco.org slash challenge. And if you're looking specifically for the prizes and how to um, become eligible for those, you can go to sustainablecoco.org slash challenge prizes. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks guys. And now it's time to hear from our second and final presenter of the night, Natasha Benjamin. She is the Director of Policy and Outreach at the Marine Applied Research and Exploration. So we're gonna get started with two truths and a lie. Natasha, would you like to read off your two truths and a lie? Sure, thanks. Um, number one is I got certified to be a scuba diver at the age of 13. Number two is I accidentally crashed a robotic submarine into the Golden Gate Bridge. And number three is while Dave diving in the Cayman Islands, I got a hickey from a stingray. Oh, these are fun. Oh my gosh. All right. So a little poll should come up and you guys should be able to vote for two truths and a lie, just like last time. So go ahead and put that in there. We'll give you a minute. All right, All right. let's give it one more second. Okay, we're going to close the poll. Um, Natasha, if you want to tell everyone um, what the lie was, I will go ahead and show the results after. Oh, Natasha, you're on mute. Sorry. Oh, the lie good. is I accidentally crashed a robotic submarine into the Golden Gate Bridge. And the other two are true. <laughs> yep. <laughs> wow. How, how, how do you get certified to be a scuba diver at 13? That's impressive. That was the rules back then. Um, I'm not sure what they are now, but I bet you can probably get certified at 13 or probably even younger now. Shell wow. might, Shell might know. <laughs> Very nice. All right. And a hickey from a stingray? Yep. Um, I was uh, scuba diving in the Cayman Islands with a whole bunch of southern stingrays and southern stingrays have uh, their mouth on the bottom, bottom half of their body. And so they can't really see what they're eating or doing. And we were feeding them. And one came over the top of my hand and tried to grab the fish, but instead ended up sucking on the top of my hand and left me a big fat hickey on my hand. So that was my, um, you know, my claim. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's Pretty excited hilarious. to get a hickey from a stingray. That's great. All right, now we're gonna move into Natasha's wonderful presentation. Natasha, take it away. Okay. Just going to share my screen here. Um, very excited to oh, let me try that again. Be with everyone tonight. Again, my name is Natasha Benjamin. I am the Development and Outreach um, Director at Marine Applied Research and Exploration. I'm going to tell you um, a little bit more about. Uh, MARE, we call Marine Applied Research and Exploration MARE for short. It's kind of a mouthful. Um, 
I, I live and work here in, um, in Contra Costa County in California. And um, so just, I live in El Cerrito and work in, in Richmond. So it's exciting to be part of this group. Um, I'm gonna take you on a little journey tonight of how, of my ocean story and how I got here. Um, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna kind of do it backwards than the way Shale did it, but I'm gonna talk about my background and my education and my work experience working with marine applied research and exploration now and, and how I got here. So this is how it all started. Um, as soon as I could swim, my dad took me snorkeling in the Florida Keys where he grew up. And um, as soon as I could get certified at 13, I got certified to be a scuba diver. And I knew at a very, very young age that I wanted to spend my life as, with, with as much time in the ocean as possible. And um, I grew up in New York City and downtown Manhattan and um, knew that if I wanted to study the ocean, I needed to get out of New York City. Um, so I spent all of my vacations down in the Florida Keys, diving with my dad, learning how to fish and dive. And, um, I, and as I did that through my teenage years, I started to see the, the reefs changing. Um, the big groupers and the snappers that I saw um, growing up um, were starting to get smaller. And some of the species that I saw on the reefs were not there anymore. And some of the big staghorn corals and brain corals that I saw when I was younger, they, weren't, they were slowly disappearing. So I knew I wanted to spend time in the ocean. I saw the ocean changing before my, my eyes really and um, I was pretty, pretty sure that I wanted to find a way to study marine biology and, and help and help this ocean. Um, I think Shale did a, a wonderful job of explaining that first moment when you get in the water and you get to look underwater and see this whole new world. Um, and it was a magnificent world that many people didn't have access to. And I felt really fortunate that I did and that my dad, that my dad showed me this, this new world and I wanted to, I wanted to protect it. Um, in the beginning, I thought um, I was going to, I really wanted to study marine mammals, dolphins, whales. A lot of people I think that start, uh, that are interested in marine science in the ocean start there. Um, and I spent a lot of time um, learning about dolphins and their behavior. And was, that's kind of how it started. But um, once I started applying to schools and taking classes in college as, as I was getting my bachelor's degree, I realized that I was actually much more interested in fish and ecosystems and whole ecosystems. I applied to many schools and ended up at Boston University. They have a really good program in marine, marine biology and you get to spend a semester in Woods Hole at one of the most famous marine biology laboratories in the world, um, which is also housed right next to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And Woods Hole on Cape Cod, an hour from Boston, was this marine science mecca. And I got to study with some of the top marine scientists and take fish biology co courses in Central America. And I knew I was on my path. But I, I didn't feel ready to kind of pursue the purely academic track and do and get like a master's and or a PhD and just do lab work. I wanted, I wanted to be in the field more and I also really wanted to make a difference. And I felt like in order to do that, I needed some more skills besides those basic science skills that I had learned in undergrad. So I took a year off um, I worked a number of different jobs to pay the bills, but I did an internship at the New England Aquarium where um, they have an amazing conservation program and education program. And I got to see how to use my skills in marine science and, and, and work with the public. Um, I should also mention um, that when I was growing up in New York, the one way in high school to be involved in the ocean was to volunteer at the New York Aquarium, which is out on Coney Island. 
And so I did spend my summers volunteering there. After college, I volunteered here at the New England Aquarium and spent a year researching graduate schools and um, applying to graduate schools and realizing that I wanted to focus more on the policy side. I wanted to take my background in science, learn about policy and management and how we manage our resources um, and be able to speak both of those languages. So that took me to Miami, Florida um, to the University of Miami and the Rosensteel School of Marine and Atmospheric, Atmospheric Sciences, otherwise known as RASMUS, which is on um, a little island, one of the first islands off of Miami as the Florida Keys comes down. And I studied what they call marine affairs or what most people call marine policy. So this was a year program where I got to dive into all sorts of at different aspects of marine policy, law, um, aquaculture, marine archaeology, kind of the social sciences behind the marine science, um, taking my science background and using it to understand how, what research is really needed to inform and manage these resources and what laws are in place and, and how that whole system worked. And as part of the program, and I don't know if it's still like that now, but when I was there, um, you did uh, a few semesters of coursework in Miami, and then it's a, it was a thesis master's um, where you do an internship and you write your, in, your thesis based on that internship. And you can go anywhere in the world to do that. And I, um, I knew that I wanted to work with fishermen and work more on, on fisheries issues, what was happening with fish populations, what was happening with overfishing. And I ended up um, in San Francisco. And um, I ended up working with two, actually three different organizations as part of my thesis, my master's thesis and part of this internship and comparing fisheries conservation work coming from two different sides. Um, one side was working with ocean conservation, which actually had a different name back then, but now it's called ocean conservation and they had offices in San Francisco. Um, and I worked with them half time and the other half of the time I worked with a group called PCFFA and IFR, which stands for the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations and the Institute for Fisheries Resources. This was a group um, that was put together by a group of fishermen that saw the need for protecting the resource that they depended on as their livelihood. Um, and my, my thesis was looking at different fishery conservation measures through the lenses of a traditional nonprofit NGO environmental group um, versus coming from the fishing community and how they were tackling some of these issues. And it was fascinating. It blew my mind. I got to work with um, a man named Zeke Grader, who was really, um, who was my mentor and brought me all over the world, actually, to look at fisheries policy issues. Um, and he's a very well-known man in the fishing world, especially in the Bay Area and California. Um, and uh, that actually turned into a job. Um, my internship turned into a job. I continued to work with the fisheries group and spent years working on different fisheries policy issues. After I left there, I did consulting work for a number of different organizations, including the Monterey Bay Aquarium. I was really interested in the market side of how groups were trying to develop market approaches. Um, some of you might be familiar with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch card, which ranks seafood, um, trying to encourage consumers who are gonna eat seafood, a lot of people don't, um, but those that do, to try to source those products and source the seafood from places and from fishermen that are trying to do the right thing. Um, in addition to that, I also wanted to get more involved in my local government. Uh, and I um, sat on the city of El Cerrito's environmental quality committee here in El Cerrito where I live um, and got to work on local issues, environmental issues, not so much ocean issues, but getting that experience of um, working with local government, coming up with projects, um, working with 
the, the city council and public citizens um, and trying to engage the public on, on, on how we can all make a difference as individuals. Um, and over that time, um, and just spending a lot of time living in the Bay Area, working by the ocean, diving in the ocean, watching what was happening uh, here in the Bay Area and up and down the coast as someone who is a surfer and a diver and just spent a lot of time in the ocean, I realized that there was so much more that we needed to understand in order to manage our oceans. And that's what led me to marine applied research and exploration was um, to knowing that we needed to document what was going on. I had done a lot of work on advocacy and policy issues. And now I, I wanted to be able to get that information so we could make really good decisions about what was going on in the ocean. So um, I ended up about nine years ago at, at this group, Marine Applied Research and Exploration. We're a nonprofit research group uh, right here in Point Richmond, and we use robotic technology to collect scientific information. We take over where divers leave off. So divers can only go so deep and stay down and collect information. And we use different robots and underwater vehicles to collect that information so that we can make informed decisions. At Mare, I wear many hats. We're a very small group. There's about nine of us. Um, we have an office in Point Richmond and an office up in Northern California in Humboldt County. And, um, you know, my background in marine science and policy has allowed me to work on a lot of, diff a lot of different pieces of this ocean science and conservation world. I usually am sitting in front of a computer, but every once in a while I do get out on the boat and this is, and work with our engineers and our scientists to collect the information. So this is what it looks like when someone is driving in a remotely operated vehicle or a underwater robot. Um, you're looking at a bunch of screens and the robot is, thousands, is hundreds to thousands of feet below the sea level collecting imagery. Um, we have a bunch of different tools that we use to collect this information. This is an, uh, one of our um, ROVs. ROV stands for a remotely operated vehicle. And in addition to working on collecting data, I also um, spend time working on the policy side, talking to legislators, trying to figure out what information we need to protect and conserve ocean resources. Um, this includes going to DC, talking to legislators about important bills that are in place, going to Sacramento, um, and making sure that we have the funding to do this work ultimately, and the political will to change some of the systems that are not working. So um, I like to say that I, I, I can speak both the science language and the policy language and try to understand what each group needs um, to, to protect our oceans. I also uh, direct our education program at Mare. We work with high schools all around the Bay Area, middle and high school students, um, teaching them about marine science and technology. And um, uh, there'll be a link to our education program. I hope some of you, we can get involved with other students who are looking for schools to work with in the Bay Area. Um, and we do a whole STEM engineering challenge as well. Uh, some of the things that we talk about um, in those education programs and really why we're doing this work is because of, of the impacts on our oceans. We, there are many impacts on our oceans right now. We're dealing with overfishing, we're dealing with climate change, we're dealing with pollution. And this is why we're collecting this important information. This was probably the graph in, in college that hit me the hardest um, to see what was happening with fish populations over the last 50 to 75 years in terms of how we've impacted fish populations. Um, it's, there's been a drastic decline um, in a lot of fish populations and this increase in this overfishing pressure. And the reality is we don't really know what's going on below the surface. In the old days, 
um, they would take a net and drag it through the ocean and bring the net on board the boat and count the dead fish on the deck in order to figure out how many fish were in the ocean. Now we use um, underwater robots to, to make that happen. This is our, to collect that information. Instead of counting dead fish, we get to go down and count them alive in their own habitat. This is the remotely operated vehicle that we use um, that really allows us to go where no one else can go. Um, divers can't go this deep, and so this is what we use. We also have a boat here in Richmond that we use to do our research. We work with a team of engineers and scientists um, and a number of different types of vehicles depending on what data we're collecting. So here's our fleet. Each one does slightly different things. And this is the area that we work in. Um, this is where most of the fish reside. We kind of, here's where the divers leave off. And then here's where Mari's vehicles can go and collect that information. Uh, here is a short video. I wonder if it'll start at the beginning. Yep. Um, so we work off different platforms, different boats. Um, to launch the ROV, that's our Beagle ROV. We drive it away from the boat and then we dive it down. This ROV can go to um, a thousand meters. So that's quite deep. We're usually around 300 to 600 meters because that's where most of the fish like to hang out. Um, and every time we go down, we see something new, which is pretty exciting. And we're able to collect this visual information and turn it to data. We also have a manipulator arm on the ROV if we need to take samples um, and we can bring those samples back and, um, and analyze them in the lab and, um, and find out more about what we're doing. This, is, this shows kind of the process of collecting that information um, and, and getting all of the data that we need. We use that data to create maps and really look at change over time. This is relative change over time, which is important to understanding what's happening in these marine ecosystems. We can use this information to understand what's happening in our marine protected areas. We have 124, as you guys now know, because of the quiz at the beginning, 124 marine protected areas, which are underwater parks um, along our coast. And we're, we're studying those, those parks. Um, we're seeing increase in fish population in these little protected areas. Um, we're also seeing increases in fish population outside. They're spilling over. They don't know where the lines are. Um, so this is the kind of information that we're collecting. We're also studying deep sea corals, which are amazing. I wish I had more time to talk about them. Um, these are corals that live in the dark, dark deep ocean with no photosynthesis, no light, like the, the corals that Shell was talking about. Um, and they can live for thousands of years and we're just starting to understand them and document them. We've also used the ROVs to identify new species. This is um, one of the species we found here right um, off the coast of Marin, right on, you know, through the Golden Gate Bridge. We've also been able to document when different species have disappeared. We lost a lot of sea stars along the coast of California in the last 10 years. And we were able to go back to the video and look and see when we saw that decline happen. And here you can see some graphs about that. So lots of different reasons, um, lots of different purposes for this information and really exciting to see um, how we can use that information to make change and, and protect our oceans. Um, a little bit about STEM careers. Um, for those that are interested at MARE, we um, have biologists, engineers, video analysis, analysts. Um, we have people that work on GIS and mapping. It's really a mix of different, different careers. Um, these are kind of a, all the different ways you can get into ocean conservation. Um, there's the social science side, there's the more of the traditional biologist side, 
there's the engineering side, there's the mapping, there's even maritime archaeology. There's many different ways to get involved in ocean sciences and ocean conservation. Uh, these are a few resources that will be linked, I believe, afterwards um, about careers in STEM. Um, and I think that is it for me. Um, can't wait to hear all of your questions. And thank you, guys. Thank you very much, Natasha. I really like that picture of you with the dolphin. This is really cool. All right. <laughs> Now we're going to move on to our famous Q&A session. You, the audience, are going to be able to ask Natasha and Shale any question you would like. Just please make sure that you direct it to either Natasha or Shale or both so we know who to give the question to. Easy peasy. And some of you guys have already typed some amazing, amazing questions in. So we're going to start off with some of those. Evan, I'm going to hand it off to you. Awesome. Thank you. So I'll start the first one off with, I'll give this one to Shale. Have you, have you experienced any um, issues related to microplastic pollution during your research, research or exploration? Um, I'd say it's actually more macroplastic. Um, where since coral reefs are relatively shallow, um, a lot of the like fishing line, fishing nets, um, plastic containers like big pieces of plastic are things that are getting stuck on corals and coral reefs and so for us that's kind of more of the major things that we're seeing day to day um microplastics are definitely a problem and there's other groups who are doing research actually looking at the coral polyps ability to act, to consume microplastics and so that's an active area of research right now oh, that's really interesting Okay, this next one is for Natasha. It sounds like you've tried to explore as much as possible in the Bay Area. Would you say it was hard to find a balance between trying new things and staying in one place? Um, I, you know, I've, I've been here for about 20 years now, and um, it's kind of, it's a, it's a great hub in terms of ocean conservation and ocean science. But um, I do end up traveling. And I think one of the things that's been really important is what, what I've learned here in California, especially around marine protected areas. We're starting to take what we've learned here and bring it to other places. We're working in Hawaii. We're working in the Caribbean now. California is kind of a leader um, in a lot of these environmental issues. And a lot of other places are looking at California now. So. Um, I, I love it here, but um, I'm ready also, as my kids get a little older, I'll probably, you know, expand and, and go to new places. Awesome, thank you. And um, I also give this one to Natasha, since you seem like more of the policy person, or I know you definitely are interested in environmental policy. What would you say is the key to educating and encouraging our government to get involved with our earth and take care of it? Great question. Um, getting involved in your local politics, your state, polit po you know, politicians, local politicians are usually the most approachable, but you guys are all constituents in someone's district that has to answer your phone call. And you should feel every right to call them up and tell them that you're worried about something or that you saw something or that you want them to do something about um, you know, sea stars or otters or whatever it is that you're interested in. Um, we all have a voice at that level. Um, and there's tons of groups to get involved with in more of the citizen science and citizen action. Um, and I'm happy to throw some of those in the chat. But just remembering that we all this, you know, we all have a voice here and writing letters to your local government is the first is the first place to start. Shale, any other add on to that? Yeah, I actually really appreciate that you are the policy side because it's something that I very strongly considered for many years. Um, if I could have more of an impact over there than I can in research. And like, I think the last thing I'll add to your great answer is that, um, you know, there are so many ways to have an impact on policy. 
And if you're not the kind of person who feels comfortable, like calling or, you know, showing up at protests, for example, like there are other, like find the things that are you're passionate about and like use those things, whether it's like art or music or, you know, anything that you um, already do that you really like, you know, there's lots of ways to engage your communities on a lot of these issues and just kind of finding the thing that feels the best to you will mean you'll, you'll get involved in it more. That's amazing. Thank you, Natasha and Shale. And this one, Shale, I know you already answered this one as like a type out on the Q&A little form, but if you could read it out loud or just tell the rest of the audience your answer to this, that would be amazing. This one, is, is biology as a major required to get into a marine related job or would other environmental majors work as well? Yeah, so that's something I always tell people, like don't go to graduate school unless you like need to get a graduate degree to do what it is you wanna do. Um, Cause it's a lot of sacrifice. Um, and for me, it was worth it cause I needed the degree to be a, a researcher um, at you know a university or another research institution. Um, most jobs will require a, a biology or related degree in this sort of field um, or X number of years of experience. And so very often for folks who are switching careers, um, they might not have been doing like marine biology related research, but they've had, maybe they've you know been working in like a biotech lab or in pharmaceuticals or like in something totally different where like, you're, you're gaining the skill set that you can then sort of transfer over to these new positions. And so things are a little bit more flexible. Um, so it really depends on what type of job you want. Um, sort of what Natasha was saying, like there's a lot of ways to have an impact on the marine environment, like from, you know, basic biology and research to policy, to education, to communications. There's a lot of different ways to do it. So um, I have a lot of friends who are in communication related jobs who have biology undergraduate degrees, but then went a different direction, maybe journalism, for example, um, and are, you know, they're the people who are able to translate the scientific research, which sometimes it'll, is a little jargony, into um, ways that are more easily accessible to the general public. So definitely something to consider, but not necessarily necessary. Thank you. And the next one is for Natasha. And this is actually one that I also have been wondering about. Um, if you could explain or expand upon the graph of overfishing, um, just for the audience, it was a bit clearer. If you want to screen share again, it's okay. But if not, you can also just um, talk about it off the top of your head. Yeah, I went through some of the slides pretty quick. Um, I was like watching the time all of a sudden. Uh, so what happened over the last hundred years basically is technology has improved our capacity to go to deeper for far away places has improved and expanded and pressure pressure on fishing has just exponentially increased over the last hundred years drastically um in 19 in the 1970s was the first time we started really thinking about fisheries management on the national level. And we, and we created a, a national policy called the Magnuson Stevens Fisheries Conservation Act, something like that. And um, at first what it did was to try to kick out all of the foreign vessels that were in our territorial, US territorial waters. Um, we wanted to give rights to American fishermen and make sure they had access. Uh, but what that also did was subsidize the fishing industry to, tremendously to increase their capacity. And there was too much fishing going on. We kicked out the foreign fleets, but we created this army of fishermen and not really knowing the science and the capacity that these fish stocks could handle. Um, and there was a huge drop in fish population, a huge increase in fishing and fish populations started dwindling after that. Uh, in the, since then, we have developed um, scientific methods to understand ecosystems as a whole, not just like the cod fish and what happens to that cod fish, but how the entire ecosystems work. And that's really the only way to manage fisheries and fish populations in the ocean. Um, so fish stocks are slowly rebuilding because of the change in our management system. And 
but we had a huge impact that some of these fish populations will never come back. Um, and now what we're seeing is climate change on top of decades of overfishing in many areas. California and, and most of the US is highly managed and regulated at this point, but globally, there's still a massive amount of overfishing that takes place on top of climate change. So it's complicated and it's different um, in the US and in other areas, but um, there's also on top of that, a whole illegal unreported fishing that happens where we, those don't show up in the graphs, but they're happening. And that also has a huge impact on our fish populations. I don't know if that answered the question, but. I think that was a very good answer. Thank you, Natasha. Okay, this one is for shale and here we go. I actually want to know about this. How did you go about researching grad schools? Did you go on school tours or just research online? And how did you find the one that fit best for you? The great question. Um, so I had a very different experience from undergrad to grad. Uh, undergrad, I applied to like six or seven schools, went and visited, narrowed them down. But like I said, I think part of being an older graduate student, going back to school a little bit later in life, I knew exactly what I wanted to do and who I wanted to work with and what I wanted to do. So I, um, I reached out to some professors who, like when you apply to graduate school for research biology, you get accepted by the school, but you also get accepted by your primary advisor. And so you reach out in advance, ask if they're taking students into their lab. Um, you ask them questions about, you know, like how, do their, how are their students funded? What kind of mentor are, is this person? You know, is the lab group big? Um, I also definitely always interview the other students to kind of get a real idea of how that lab environment is because they're all very different. Um, as I mentioned in the talk, for me, it was very important to find a mentor who would let me be my full self. Um, in science, there's definitely a very wide range of mentorship styles. Um, and so for me, um, I'm LGBTQ and coming out in, in advance before I got an advisor and accepted myself into a program that I was going to spend, you know, six years of my life in, it was like really important for me to come out early, make sure that I could, you know, that I had support, that I could be who I am there. Um, and I wanted uh, to find an advisor who also did a lot of science communication, a lot of advocacy for the ocean as well. And so my advisor, Ruth Gates, um, was like all of those things, um, like pretty much the best mentor I could have ever asked for. And I only applied to her lab. Um, I talked to her, we had a Skype and, you know, she, we hit it off right off the bat. And, you know, also to say like my, I'm a very bad standardized test taker. And so like, I took the GRE, but I did not do very well. And she was like, it's okay. Like, if you don't do well and it's between you and someone else, I just have to fight harder to get you in. So like, you know, there, there's like requirements that grad schools will ask you for, but like, there's always some flexibility. So finding someone who will advocate for you and who wants you to help you grow is really important as opposed to just do their research for them. Um, and so, yeah, for my PhD, I did that, applied to one lab, got in. And also, as I mentioned, for my master's, I was already, at first I started volunteering at the Academy of Sciences and then they hired me. Um, so I ended up working there for, like six or seven months. And I was like, wait a second, like, why would I like move somewhere else? Um, I should stay here. And so I, you know, just applied to that one school to work on this stuff that I was already interested in and already working on um, to do that. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of different questions to ask, you know, about that mentorship style, about funding in the lab, about how much freedom you have. Um, and if nothing else, like once you find someone who you think is a good fit, set up some one-on-ones with the students or the lab techs in there, and they will give you a very honest answer about really, you know, once you know your own mentorship style, will that work with them or not? Um, but people will be very honest with you and finding a good fit for you, it's as much it's as, as, if not more important than you being a good fit for them. Natasha, do you have anything to add sort of that? Um, just reiterating the relationship piece of this all. I mean, you can get all the grades and scores in the world, um, but I think the uh, the further along you are in the in this kind of career path as well, like it's really comes down to relationships. Um, and it's such a great example that Shale gives about Ruth, um, Ruth Gates, who's famous, um, well-known researcher um, who we've who unfortunately have lost. Um, and 
you know, you obviously made a connection with her and that's what, that's what did it. Um, and I've found that time and time again, um, in my, through my graduate, you know, my graduate experience and the internships and those relationships that I made actually has set me up for the last 20 years of my career. Um, and I just, I ended up in, you know, you, you meet, you meet people and if you connect with them and you feel like you're part of that community, um, it can take you a long, long way. Awesome. Thank you both. I like both those answers. Uh, next one is for Shale. I heard that some people living in Hawaii get island fever. Did that ever happen to you? So I feel so grateful and honored to have been able to live in Hawaii to do my graduate degree and do research there. It's a very, very special place. Um, it was really uh, challenging for me to be so far away from my family, um, especially with the time change. Like my mom lived in Florida. So that's like a six hour time change uh, during some part of the year. And so, you know, starting over being so far away, um, especially I was very politically active in San Francisco. Um, and it's just very different. Like people care less about you when you're not in the center of it all. So it was a very different change for me. Um, like I said earlier in my talk, a part of what I love about this career is that I kind of get all the pieces. So I travel a lot for conferences, I travel a lot for research. So very often, you know, I was finding my way back to the mainland um, where I was able to like really, you know, maintain those connections over time. So it was a, it was a, it was a give and take, but I feel very lucky to have had that experience. Thank you, Shale. Okay, the next question is for Natasha. This comes from Diane. Natasha, is there a marine volunteer or summer program that you recommend for a high school aged grant for Diane's high school aged granddaughter living in Cupertino? I don't know any for high school. Um, we, we do an internship with um, the CSU system. They have a coast program and we get marine biology and engineering students through that, but that's on the college level. Um, I'm assuming the Aquarium of the Bay and Cal Academy of Sciences um, would have more programs geared towards um, high school internship programs. Maybe Shale has ideas as well. Yeah, I'd say maybe um, like Long Marine Lab in Santa Cruz um, or even some stuff in Moss Landing might, like for summer type programs, I could see that would probably be my, my bet to check out. Awesome, thank you. Um, I know one person asked this for both of you guys. What would you guys say is the best part of your job? Um, I'll have Shale go first. The best part, that's so hard, depends <laughs> on the day. Um, so right now at the Shed Aquarium, I work with one of my best friends. Um, and this is like, just as Natasha was saying, your community matters so much. So having the opportunity to work at a world-class institution but worth a sci like work scientifically with someone who I've known for many years that we get along really well. Like we were just able to hit the ground running. And, you know, there's like science can be really frustrating at times. Things don't work, you know, <laughs> as the way you expect them to. You have to solve problems on the fly. And when you have a really, really strong relationship, like we're always spinning ideas off each other. It's a very creative and productive space. And so, you know, the people you work with really make all the difference. Um, I would say that, you know, in the, just recently I've found that I, I, we started this education program through Mare and working with students and doing things like this, I actually really enjoy. Um, it's extremely rewarding. If my story can inspire someone, then I couldn't really ask for anything more. Um, in addition to that, kind of on a, a different side, I've, we've been using film, um, making short films as one of the tools for outreach. And I found that I'm love, I love working on that. I love telling the story through film, do editing, um, doing interviews and trying to get people to explain what we're doing. Uh, so I'm seeing a, a kind of a new path in, in the film communication side of ocean science. 
And that's really what I've been enjoying most um, these days. That is really very cool. Thank you, Natasha and Shale. And this one comes from my friend Tati. What advice would you give teenagers slash young adults who want to get into politics and advocate for environmental health? This is for both of you guys. So Natasha, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, there's so many ways to get involved. Um, I There's uh, many programs where you can spend a semester or a, a year or a few years in DC um, through Sea Grant fellowships, through there's a Canals Fellowship. There's there's all these fellowships, and I I always wish that I had done one of those, but I, I missed that boat. Um, and it looks like it's an, it seems like an amazing experience to get that kind of political side and be in D.C. and be in the middle of it and work in a legislative office and get to talk to all the constituents and groups that come in and learn about the issues, um, and then work directly with a policymaker with a legislator. Um, where you're informing them about what's going on. So if there's a if if you haven't seen one of those opportunities, um, if that's the path, if you really want to do the go on the policy path, I think that's one of the best ways to get the experience and to figure out if you really do want to do policy, because policy is complicated and messy, and um, you got to deal with a lot of angry people um, when you're working in ocean policy, environmental policy, any kind of policy. Yeah, all I would add to that would be, you know, getting involved in youth government initiatives um, already and like starting to attend town halls, as Natasha mentioned earlier, like this stuff is happening all around you in your communities. And a big part of where you can be really impactful is, you know, if if you become sort of a familiar face in a community, whether it's to other community members or the people who represent your communities, you know, those town halls will talk about all these different issues. But then when the issue that you're passionate about comes up, you're not just an outsider coming in saying, hey, this is the one thing I care about. So I've shown up for this, but you, you know, you've already become someone that is known and trusted. And so, you know, really building those relationships over time can be really helpful. Um, but yeah, other than that, I'd say, you know, everything that Natasha said, but also um, the, yeah, the more you kind of find other like-minded people, like very often um, we have a youth program at the shed and uh, some of the teenagers in that program together were like, oh, we want to start a program at our school where we are like raising awareness and raising money to help like coral reef conservation um, efforts. And so often it's just finding one other person who has the same, you know, ideas as you and the same passions as you. And together you can really like play off each other in that creative energy and who knows, you know, what you'll come up with. Awesome, thank you both. So it looks like we have one last question for today. It's for both. So since Shale just talked, I'll have Natasha go first, I guess. Um, do you have any advice for finding a career in informal marine science education that also involves research? Hmm. Informal marine science and education and research. Um, I mean, I know a lot of groups that need people like that. I don't know if there's programs specifically geared towards that, but I think there's more on the marine, there's definitely more on marine science communication. I don't know them offhand. Um, I think that's a newer thing. Those the program, like master's programs in marine in science communication wasn't such a thing. Um, but now there's a lot of groups. Compass is one group that, um, is known for not just ocean, but all science communication. And I would look like at who works for Compass and where they went to school maybe <laughs> as a way to work backwards. Um, but a lot, I do know a lot of people who will get like an undergrad in marine science and then a master's in communication or education. Um, I know there's environmental education programs as well. I just don't know any of them offhand, but I bet Shale might know a couple. Yeah, um, so museums are a great place to do this. So working at an institution that does both um, is a very nice way to bridge. So when I was uh, basically a teaching assistant at the Cal Academy and I was offered the position to work with the high school students there, like. I was able to develop any program I wanted. So I was like, oh, we're gonna team up with the aquarium and let's do a research 
project with them. Like, and so we asked the question, like, how does the frozen fish they used to feed the animals degrade in vitamins and minerals over time when it's stored? And that was something that they wanted to know and something that the students can then test out. And so um, there's a lot of opportunities when you're in spaces um, like a museum or an aquarium, but also, you, you know, any kind of like eco center or any informal education space that's in any environment, doesn't have to be in the forest or on the ocean. Um, you know, there's nature all around you. So teaming up um, with any sort of like local universities uh, in the area, a lot of us are always looking to do this kind of work when, you know, folks are like, hey, you know, we're interested in the trees in this area. Who in your department like works on this stuff? Maybe we can work together and ask questions. So you don't necessarily have to invent a whole new space, but kind of leverage the resources in your community already. That is very cool. Doing research as a high schooler sounds amazing. I know I'm in high school right now. And we don't have a lot of opportunities to actually do real research. And that sounds incredibly cool. So I think that is about it for our climate careers chat. If you guys would like to Shale and Natasha talk about any of the other resources our audience can look up afterward, if they're interested in learning more, if you guys would like to talk about them, now's the time. So Shale, I'll hand it off to you first. Um, take a screenshot of the slide and I'll use the last few seconds just to say, um, like just very much related to what you just said, Rachel, like my advice is to ask for what you want. Like if you want to get a research experience, like cold email people, if you don't know anyone at that area, um, people will ignore you. People will not email you back. People will, you know, this happens all the time. Don't get discouraged. Like sometimes professors are getting hundreds of emails literally a day, but you know, like, at, you know, try to really, really reach out, like, and say, hey, this is who I am. I'm interested in this. I saw your website. I think it's really cool. Are you looking for volunteers? Are you, you know, do you have any tech positions coming up? But um, yeah, like, definitely ask, let it be known to your teachers that you're looking for something to do this summer, for example, in marine sciences, but just, you know, putting yourself out there, like something will bite. It was great to be here. So thank you. Yeah, just want to re reiterate what Shale said. I get tons of emails asking for internship opportunities, jobs. Can you talk to my you know, fifth grader who's doing a research project on whales? Um, and if those emails hit me at the right moment, at the right day, when I have the capacity, um, I'm, I'm more than happy to respond. Um, and I've gotten cold email, cold call emails of people looking for jobs and actually ended up hiring them when we weren't even looking for someone. We hadn't even posted a job, but someone described themselves in a way that and showed their interest in what we were doing. And I was like, you know what? Let's make it, let's make it, you know, a part-time position for this person. Let's make something work. And if it's the right fit, um, and you put yourself out there, like putting yourself out there is number one. And you, you're not going to get a response probably maybe even most of the time, but you will. And, um, just being persistent and I'll get emails from folks, like even every like six months, just checking back in and that's okay. Um, people will ignore your email if they can't handle it at the moment, but, um, ask for what you want. I really like that shale. So, um, a few resources here just about STEM education, um, Mari's education program, and uh, thank you all. Great to be here. Good luck, everyone. Well, thank you very much. Now, Evan, since this is your last Climate Careers Chat, would you like to wrap it up for us? Thank you. Yeah, I would just like to say a big thank you to everyone joining and listening. And once again, also a huge thank you to both of our panelists for sharing a window into their really cool lives. Um, if you're interested in SCOCO, SLEA, or anything related to the panelists, you can go check the chat. Um, I know Kyle and the team behind the scenes, they dropped a bunch of links. And with that, we'll see you in the next Climate Careers chat. So thank you so much to everybody. Uh, we have a few thank yous first. Oh, my bad. <laughs> no worries. Um, thank you everyone for attending tonight. And thank you, Natasha and Shale, so much for being our panelists. This was just a really robust, very cool Climate Careers chat. And I personally loved watching this. So that was just so cool. 
Um, and something that really is sticking with me right now in my mind is ask for what you want. Like that's just so important and really to just kind of incorporate that into your daily life is just really important. Um, I would also like to thank everyone who worked on this wonderful program. Um, thank you to our Climate Careers Chat intern, Mia. Um, you are doing an awesome job being the program intern. Um, thank you to Rachel and Evan for moderating. And Evan, thank you for participating for the last few Climate Careers Chat chats as a moderator. Um, big thank you to Kyle for, for all of the work that you do behind the scenes, in front of, in front of the audience, everything. Um, most of the graphics you saw here for the presentation were made by Kyle, including our background. So it's really cool to um, see someone who can represent what it is that we're talking about and learning about so nicely. Um, and thank you so much to the Contra Costa Library um, for working with us. Jackie, we love working with you on this program and we love to share your enthusiasm for sustainability and also this LEA team. So that's definitely just so important to us at Sustainable Contra Costa and we really appreciate that. And Albert, same to you. Thank you for all of your help on this and we look forward to doing just so many more programs together. Um, but yeah, everyone, thank you so much for coming. This was this was great. Um, I'm gonna hand it off to Jackie if you have any closing thoughts and then we can, um, yeah, go ahead and say our good night. Thank you much, Ellie. You guys are amazing. As I say with every career chat, y'all give me hope for the future. Thank you so much. <laughs>